Okay, so we'll revive our motivation with Shakti Muni Buddha Mantra. I, I, kind of like the good news to make us happy about the path, and then we'll do a little meditation. So um, if you have questions while I'm explaining this, please just jump in. Um, we'll start with the bottom, and the bottom is a, just a little sliver of a monastery. And the little sliver of the monastery represents renunciation or the determination to be free from samsara. So, if you want to develop calm abiding, sh uh, serenity, shine, shamatha, single pointed concentration on a virtuous object, that, then you have to start with do I want to get out of samsara or not? Yeah, do I want to make samsara more comfortable? Well, then I will develop concentration for that reason. Do I want to get out of samsara? Well, then I will develop concentration for that reason. Because there are forms of higher concentrations that people who are not aspiring to get out of samsara and who are not aspiring to um, Buddhahood or enlightenment can also achieve. It's just a skill or a tool. So we want to ask ourselves, is the stability I seek fulfilling the aim of my path? Is my path something to do with non-harmfulness, something to do with altruism? because those are the best reasons to start to develop higher levels of concentration. We don't want higher levels of concentration in order to be able to manipulate people better, or to be able to scam people better, or etc, etc, right? So you're starting with renunciation. So liberation, or um, the goal of renunciation, nirvana, is achieved through the union of calm abiding, this higher concentration, and then special insight focused on emptiness. So the union of those two is what begins the process of cutting the root of samsara. So if you have special insight or you understand the lack of inherent existence, that is wonderful, but it's not going to have the power you need unless it's combined with this kind of concentration. So you repeat that and you repeat that until all of your afflictive obscurations cease and you achieve nirvana. So you're just kind of sitting with, all right, I'm focusing to get out of this mess, I'm focusing to get free, and when I'm in this free position, I'm also going to add the Mahayana motivation of for others, for others, for others. Um, often we talk about how bodhicitta, this mind of enlightenment, is this beautiful, warm-hearted attitude seeking to become a Buddha for the benefit of all, and there's something really relatable and beautiful about talking about altruism and compassion and loving kindness, right? When we talk about the correct view of emptiness, cutting the root of samsara and kind of looking at reality in a more precise way, this ties into things we understand about context or about conditioning or, you know, there's some sort of relatability with those two aspects of the path. But renunciation is the thing that is very new when you come into Buddhism. You know, things about bodhicitta and emptiness, you might not have called them that, but there was some sort of reference for what we're discussing. Do you agree? Something about warm-heartedness, something about seeing context already in your life before you ever met Buddhism. But then renunciation, this is the big question. Can you actually end suffering? Can you actually stop creating the causes for suffering? So this is a really big question, and if you're not feeling settled or confident with your renunciation, that is to be expected because that one of the three principal aspects of the path is maybe the hardest to relate to. So keep studying the Four Noble Truths, that helps. Keep studying the Twelve Links of Dependent Arising, that helps. 
So you start there, and you're the little monk setting out, and you've got some tools with you. So here you are, the little monk, and you have a hook, and you have a lasso, or a rope. And as you're going through the different stages of the path, you need those two tools, but you need them to a lesser or greater degree. So the hook is the power of introspective awareness. The lasso is the power of mindfulness. So when we say mindfulness here, it's not forgetting. Yeah, it's not forgetting the object of your meditation. So even if your object is just an image of Shakyamuni Buddha in your mind's eye, that you're attentively coming back to again and again, you're not forgetting that or your intention to do that. Not forgetting. And then your introspection is checking the quality. Like, is it getting a bit fuzzy? Are you starting to drift? Like, you might not have lost the meditation, but you're starting to slip. So your hook of introspective awareness goes boop, 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 boop. And your lasso says, hey, 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 stay here. Yeah. So those are your two tools that you need on the path. And then there's fire. Um, at various stages as you go up and up and up and up. And at the beginning, the fire is the biggest. And to me, this was one of the most um, reassuring parts of this teaching, that the most effort is needed in the beginning. That it won't always be this hard. <laughs> yeah. That where we are at our level, this is where a lot of effort needs to happen. And the fact that it's a struggle, the fact that it seems to be two steps forward, three steps back, that that is an understood, built-in part of the human experience. And so if we put in a lot of effort here in the beginning, it's going to get easier and easier and easier as you go up the path. So that fire gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you progress. So it's related to the power of effort and the power of complete familiarity and it decreases in size, indicating the decreasing amount of effort needed to apply mindfulness and introspective awareness. <coughs> Does that make sense? You see that little fire? <coughs> How old is this uh, symbol? Yeah, it's, I, I've been trying to find out. It at least is as old as Tibetan Buddhism, so at least a thousand years old. It might mm. be older than that. Um, I, so it's unclear, and I think that we should find out, because it would make me happy. <laughs> it would make all of us happy. Wait, how old is it? The Wheel of Life came from the Buddha, so the Wheel of Life is like at least 2,600 years old. Um, because two of his disciples went to the various realms, saw things, came back and reported back, and the Buddha said, you should put that in a chart. <laughs> right? And so the Wheel of Life was developed during the Buddha's lifetime. This one I'm not sure. So if one of you finds out, tell the group. Um, and so the rest we'll just kind of do briefly. Um, the hook uh, and the lasso and the monk and the monastery we've done. The bends themselves, there are six bends. And those are related to the six powers that support you in developing concentration. The, there's a few little objects kind of up the center of the path. And they're kind of random looking objects. But basically, it's like a, a cloth or a scarf, and then a conch or a shell with perfume in it. There's some fruit, there's some two little symbols, um, there's a mirror, and they're all, you know, put in kind of uh, a stylized form, so it might not be obvious what they are, but they represent sensory distractions, right? So the cloth is like tactile sensory distraction or taste sensory distraction. So those are distractions up through up until you get kind of to the last bend, and then you're starting to really not be pulled off course by them. So the fact that we get distracted by sounds, good ones or bad ones, or the fact that we get distracted by sights and stuff, it's normal. Yeah? So just again and again, like normalizing that there's nothing wrong with you. That's the whole point of these practices, is that the things that take away your joy are common, and so removable also. And these techniques help with that. So those are the five sensory distractions related to the five senses. The elephant, okay? The elephant starts out black and crazy, and he eventually gets white and subdued. And this is uh, black like black, like nighttime, white like white, like the moon. We're talking um, actual black and white, nothing to do with race. 
recipes. <laughs> but um, when we see this black crazy elephant, it's our coarse laxity. Coarse laxity. So laxity means like that heavy side of sleep kind of feeling of just, I can't, like the fog. And so it starts out like a huge problem. You see the monk has no control over the elephant at this stage. So if you sit down and meditate and you're nice and fresh and clear for a few moments and then you're just like nodding, you may need more sleep. That's totally normal. Get more sleep. But also it's a real battle to get over laxity and the temptations of sleep. So you want to be practical here and make sure that you are getting enough sleep in your life. And that's one of the preliminaries in the Lam Rim. They talk about sleeping enough, sleeping at the right time, also not sleeping too much because that can kind of trigger a whole other layer of heaviness. But you know, just kind of know your body and know what you need because it's going to help your practice. It's just basic stuff, but sometimes we forget how, how to sleep, how to eat, how to breathe. We forget those basic things. So kind of coming back to that is important. But coarse laxity is something that you're going to have to really find out a good relationship with how to talk to yourself about it. Because sometimes we are so stressed that as soon as we start to meditate, we go into kind of a relaxed, dull fog. And it's kind of a sort of a happy, relaxed, dull fog. Like if you've been in a massage parlor or something and they're like working on your shoulders and you're sort of like drifting towards sleep, but you're sort of aware, you know, it's relaxed, it's kind of nice, but it has nothing to do with meditative focus. Spacing out. Spacing out, yeah. Spacing out. And it is spaced, it's spaced out, not spacious, and that's not at all what we want. And so that's why the advice is short sessions in the beginning so you can stay sharp through the whole session. <coughs> and if it's just a huge battle, and you can't wake yourself up with thoughts of death is coming, what will be important at the time of death, and what will my regrets be? <laughs> if that doesn't work, and you think, oh, how wonderful it is that I have Buddha nature and my mind can develop to perfection and end suffering and be of benefit to all sentient beings, hooray, hooray! If uh, neither carrot nor the stick is effective, you might just need more sleep. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to overthink it, all right? It, you know, if you just, like, no matter how you think about it, you cannot focus, you probably just need more sleep, okay? So this is coarse laxity. Subtle laxity is the rabbit, and the rabbit is sitting on top of the bum of the elephant as you go further up the path. So we might not have even come across subtle laxity yet, where you're actually able to hold your focus you're pretty clear, you're pretty stable, you're very relaxed, but there's just like a haze, like a film. There's just a little less clarity and sharpness than your mind is able to do. And that subtle laxity is very tempting because it's got that pleasant sort of whispers of sleep, but you haven't gone into the dull fog. It's just kind of like, you don't have to focus that hard. <laughs> so you know like how a bunny is like jumping around, jumping around, and then sleeping, and then jumping around, then jumping around, then sleeping, and so ears are sort of like, mm, but also, mm. there's a sort of like a, I guess, very animal, very uh, attachment-seeking nature to rabbits. Yeah, you know, like how quickly they reproduce, for example. So this subtle laxity is related to attachment. Pretty much all laxity is related to attachment or ignorance, but this little guy, this tiny rabbit that appears, that's what he's about. So the heaviness of mind, I think, we understand quite well. Then there's the monkey mind, which is the restlessness and the distraction. So we kind of bounce back and forth between a bit heavy and vague, a bit distracted and excitable. Yes? So the monkey in the beginning, he's just like, off like a shot. You cannot catch him if you tried. And it could be that we're actually not at the very beginning of this. We might actually be a few layers up if we can be concentrated in certain contexts. Um, some people have to start at the very, very beginning. Some people have had work and things in their life that have supported some kind of concentration. Sometimes musicians or artists or um, elite athletes, sometimes you've developed a kind of focus where you actually can start a little higher on the path because you already do have some focus. But in the beginning, you're chasing the monkey, who is just like, 
give me, give me, give me something to distract myself, just restless. And I think it's easy to see the way the monkey kind of chases entertaining things in the mind, like fairy tales and stories and daydreams. Sometimes we don't recognize the tendency of the monkey to create drama, like negative drama, like remembering a hard conversation or remembering a conflict. So the monkey also likes to bring up stuff from the past that is unpleasant, because sometimes unpleasant is still more entertaining than nothing. Yeah, so you gotta watch that little sucker. He's so tricky. He wants it to be exciting and noisy in there. And you have to say, hush, hush, death is coming, death is coming, <laughs> settle down. Yeah, on your deathbed, will you be happy that you indulged in those series of random conflicts that you've talked over in your mind a million times? No. no. So the monkey mind is a thing. So you'll notice that the monkey stops being as problematic, kind of up towards the top. The monk, the monk turns around and is like, all right, see you later. And the monkey's like, all right. But laxity continues to be a problem till the end, until you're sitting next to that elephant at the top of the path. So before you've achieved perfect concentration, you'll be able to really work with your restlessness and distraction in that bouncy, bouncy, hungry mind. But you'll still need to be working on your laxity, that heaviness temptation that happens for a little while longer. Um, the reason the elephant goes from black to white is just showing the level of coarseness, uh, the level of heaviness. And so his little head gets white, and then half of him is white, and then more of him is white and white and white until he's totally pacified. Um, the fire we talked about, um, the floating and flying monks up at the top, that's um, after you've achieved calm fighting, after you've achieved this concentration then you're able to go to concentrations related to the form and formless realms, or the material and immaterial realms, which are related to conversations you might have heard about with the four jhanas and things discussed in the Pali tradition um, that are really interesting meditative states that are very blissful. So that's kind of like post single pointed concentration, is those guys flying about. So does that picture make some kind of sense to you now? Did you want to ask about anything? Mm -hmm. I want to share regarding, you know, the energy and the um, subtleness of the laxity and stuff. That once, in a few months when it happens, you know, <laughs> the meditation is really sharp, really clear, and, you know, you say to yourself, I made it, then the amount of energy you get from it, even though you started very tired, for example, is huge yeah. in so many ways. So, you know, and I was thinking about getting enough sleep and so mm -hmm. on. I believe, I have no experience, but if you're a long uh, time meditator, then perhaps you even need less sleep when you do this kind of meditation because the energy, you know, absolutely gives you. Yeah, it does. Well, there's less to recover from also. You know, yeah. and why do we need to sleep in the first place? You know, there's physical reasons and then the mental reasons are processing and sifting and sorting and trying to make some sense out of our life. If you're living in the moment with good focus, you're processing things in real time. You don't have to recover from as much because you're recovering, you know, you don't have to recover. You're and just you with carry it. Them. Exactly. You don't have these heavy Exactly. And even ordinary people with no realizations in a retreat setting, what happens is that the first couple of days with the schedule starting very early and with um, the routine, there's a lot of resistance and tiredness and people are kind of fractious and grumpy the first couple of days of a retreat. But if it goes over a week or several weeks or a month, everybody just stops needing quite as much sleep. Like without forcing it, the body adjusts. And part of the way the body adjusts is because the mind is supporting it better. And so this is just regular folks. I've had this experience a million times. There's nothing special about my meditation. It needs tons more work. But in retreat, after the first couple days of, I am very tired, this is very hard, something happens to myself and pretty much everyone else where you just genuinely need less sleep. 
If you needed eight, you need five. You know, if you needed five, you need three. It's really interesting. So that happens just organically because of the meditation practice. And some of the teachers need less sleep even when they're not in retreat because they're in that atmosphere in their daily life. Um, I was just talking to, to young Zee Rimshay's attendant and she was saying about a schedule for this or that and Rimshay won't need to sleep much, you know, three, four hours max and blah, blah, blah. Like it was a normal thing. <laughs> three, four hours max, max, three, four hours. You know, but if we force ourselves to do things like that, it's a terrible idea. And if you're having um, psychological difficulties or stress or anxiety, Tibetan lamas will ask you the basic questions first. Are you eating healthy? Are you getting enough sleep? before they even talk about whatever drama is in your life or whatever deep-seated trauma is coming to the forefront. It's just, are you eating properly? Are you sleeping enough? Before we even get into anything else. So it's like we don't want to jump into what it's going to be by forcing ourselves there. We want to just do the processes and see what happens with this really open mind without expectation. But I think that uh, it is interesting to see how quickly your body and mind are happier with more practice like this, and more in alignment. So um, those six bends I mentioned are about these six powers. Um, so as you develop, you need support. Just really practical things like the power of hearing. So you just need to keep studying and going to classes and reading stuff. That supports your concentration and your practice in general. It's just common sense. And then the power of reflection, I think, is the one that is very, very, very important that we don't do a lot because it's, there's not a natural setting to do it in a group. Um, the way that Tibetan Buddhists did it traditionally was through debate. So you would go to class the first half of the day, or you'd have prayers and then go to class the first half of the day. Then the second half of the day, you'd just debate and debate and debate the things that you had learned earlier in the day. And of course also you tell jokes and muck around and blow off steam and tease each other and sometimes sit and have quiet conversations just kind of, you know, what about do to do to do, you know, but there was reflection that was a group reflection that would happen. Some traditions um, would just say, you know, kind of go into a semi-analytical meditation, a little bit more of a reflection kind of spacious place of just thinking in an organized way. So it's not necessarily an analytical meditation, technically speaking, but it's staying contained with one topic and just kind of letting your mind associate and free flow around that one topic and ask yourself questions about it. And I think for us, you know, discussion is really good, discussion groups are really good, but sometimes it feels a little bit like the ignorant leading the ignorant, you know, and then you can make yourself more tangled by talking to your peers because you thought you understood and now you hear their perspective and now you're really confused. Sometimes you hear their perspective and you collaborate and it's beautiful, but you know, it can go either way. So it's good to do in a group, but I think really, really essential is once you've been to a class, hopefully even that same day, to just sit quietly somewhere in your house, really comfy, put your feet up, you know, if you have an American reclining chair like a lazy boy, I recommend that. Put your feet up, have a really nice cup of tea, and just think about what you just learned. You think, what was it I just learned? How do I feel about it? Do I relate to it? Do I agree? Do I disagree? What's my experience of this content? You know, I don't have to rush to agree with it. Let's just see if I can remember it, first of all. And then look at what my responsiveness is to certain parts. And if I keep jumping over certain content in classes because I either don't like it or I'm confused by it or if I have resistance to it, something about that is interesting. Make a note. And then whenever I'm in class, I get really happy about this topic and really enlivened and really curious about this topic. Hmm, interesting. Make a note. You know, so that reflection period, we really don't want to ever um, jump over it even though it's not kind of built into the structure of Dharma programs because it's such an individual thing. Does that make sense? Just, and it's even a good way to approach how you read Dharma. You know, don't read it like a novel, just straight through, read like one paragraph, stop, and go, huh, okay, what's that mean? 
you know? Just, like, don't just read it, you know? Read and stop and think. Read and stop and think. It's a, it's a different way of reading. Yeah. And then um, the power of mindfulness, that non-forgetfulness. The power of introspective awareness. So kind of watching yourself do whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, what, what is my approach? What is my relation? What's the quality? Just kind of, it's your, it's your quality control manager, just hanging out. What are you doing? Um, effort, I think, is obvious. And then complete familiarity is how concentration is easier with repetition. Simple as that. So they go in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, with the six bends of the path there. Okay, so then the monk at the nine stages before he flies are the nine stages of mental abiding. Or, uh, yeah, mental abiding, we'll just say this one. So we start with placing. So the very first monk is placing the mind. And this is the state in which the mind first becomes unaffected by outer objects and fixes in the meditation object. So it doesn't mean for like a long period of time, it just means landing. Yeah, you're able to land on the breath or land on an image, whatever it is you're meditating on, you're able to actually do it even just for a couple seconds. You've placed the mind, yeah. And then the second one, continuous placement, is the establishment of the stream of mind meaning that the mind is fixed upon the object for some time by compelling the mind to consider again and again the object of concentration. So it's, it's taking some effort at this point, and this is where we are for at least, I don't know, the first few minutes of a meditation often, unless we're already pretty settled, where you land, and then you drift, and then you land, and then you sink, and then you land, and it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, you know? But continuous placement is like you've kind of only strayed a little and you're saying, come back, come back. Yeah, so you keep coming back continuously without one of those meditations where you place the mind and then started to drift and then just gave into it and went off with the fairies. Yeah, which is normal and human, but you know, you could have called it back at some point, but you were just like, yeah, this is an interesting train of thought I'm having. Yeah, so come back. <laughs> then um, replacement is the state when the mind being disturbed, one brings back the mind to the concentration object. So you're able to replace your mind back again and again. So they're very related to each other, obviously. And then close placement is the state in which the mind is expanded while exactly limited to the object. So that's an interesting way of framing it, but it's a little bit like when you're able to land on something without any tension around the holding. Your mind feels kind of wide and like there's breath and kind of expansiveness around your focus, but that kind of relaxedness and expansiveness doesn't harm your focus. So you're placing closely there, right there with your meditation object, but there's not any kind of uh, tightness or constriction around, you know, keeping it contained. Like you can stay there without having to like, you know, come back, come back with so much effort. So the fire is quite small at this point. Then taming, uh, mind taming, which is done by seeing the ill results of distracting thoughts and defilements also perceiving the advantages of collectedness, collectedness in this context meaning concentration. So one makes efforts to put away the former while establishing the mind in the latter. So at this point you're getting quite good at meditating, but what helps keep you there is that you're very firmly anchored in the content of the Dharma. So you really know that the disadvantages of an unfocused mind, the advantages of a focused mind, and you've seen that play out already in your life. You see how the development of your concentration so far has been hugely helpful. So that really encourages you to keep going. And after taming is pacification. So this is like mind calming, in which feelings antagonistic to the practice of collectiveness are quelled. 
if boredom arises regarding the collectiveness, since the mind is still hungry for sense objects, then it is thoroughly pacified at this state. So the mirror the, that represents being distracted to forms is the last of those sensory objects, and the monk on the path is leaving behind all those sensory objects at this stage. So you might have gotten pretty good at not being distracted by the senses before then, but if not, you will have done it by then, if that makes sense. Um, and at this stage, um, you're very close to the point where the monkey will be left behind as well. So, uh, thorough pacification, so then even subtle stains of the mind are set aside here, or those like subtle habits of kind of push-pull, push-pull. And then you're single-pointed, and the mind here is like an undisturbed stream and continues to flow along one-pointedly, but you have to try. So it does its work, it does its well, you're able to have that single-pointed concentration, but you still have to put some effort into it. When you're in setting an equipoise, the ninth stage, there is no need for effort, since the mind is naturally one-pointed. So it's through huge effort it becomes effortless. Just like when you know, you're a musician and you study a piece of music again and again and again, then when you go to perform it, because of that habituation, it just flows. Yeah, you've kind of become merged with the object in a sense. So it's effortless at that point. And when you have actual calm abiding, that's, that effortlessness also has that pliancy, that blissfulness. What is the equipoise? What's, what's the meaning of that? Setting an equipoise? Yeah. Equipoise, uh, sometimes we say meditative equipoise, it's just another way of saying focus, really. Yeah, setting in, in meditative equipoise, so instead of saying setting in focus, setting in that special meditative focus, we could exchange the word equipoise for focus, generally. So there's a giant chart, this is a very giant chart that seems somewhat intimidating, but we've actually covered um, everything except for the four attentions and um, the five faults and the eight antidotes, which we'll do after lunch because those are fun. So um, coming up next, how to get rid of faults. Now we will do a meditation, okay? <laughs> so let's get into a meditative posture.